So um, let's first figure out how this sentence works so that we can decide what goes in the blank. The author tells us it is not uncommon for fledgling scholars to fixate on empirical investigation. Let's stop here and look at a couple of words the author has chosen. Fledgling scholars um, are those without a lot of experience doing research. They're novices. And these novices often fixate or obsess about empirical investigation. An empirical investigation is going to refer to a focus on information that can be verified by observation or experience. So beginning scholars obsess about hard data. But why? Well, the next clause tells us. Um, fledgling scholars believe that an intense focus on statistical training, um, techniques for gathering hard data, can, um, and here we need to fill in our word, but uh, that this fo uh, focus can blank deficiencies in theory development. Um, theory development is the process of trying to explain why things happen. And the word deficiencies means that there are shortcomings or problems with the explanations developed by our novice scholars. So here it is reasonable to infer that scholars, um, whether beginning or otherwise, do not want people to pay too much attention to flaws or deficiencies in their work. With this understanding, we can quickly eliminate two answers highlight and reveal. The fledgling scholars um, do not obsess with data gathering to show readers that they've done a poor job with theory development. Speak to is a phrasal verb, and so the um, preposition to modifies the meaning of the verb speak so that to speak to something means to comment on or give evidence about that subject. Again, it's unlikely that our novice scholars want to draw too much attention to their deficient theory development, so we are going to eliminate this choice. Now, you might be tempted by undermine. The scholars do want to lessen or diminish their deficiencies, but using undermine does not work here. Undermine has a negative connotation, meaning to destabilize or weaken something, and one would not typically undermine her own work and would instead downplay or minimize uh, her own deficiencies. So we're left with compensate for, um, meaning to make up for or balance out. And the novice scholars believe that lots of verifiable data, empirical investigation, will make up for or balance out or theory development. Tossing about in a tempest, the fishing vessel. So here we have this poor boat, and a tempest is a storm. And so the boat tried to send a message, but it was so blank as to be incomprehensible or not intelligible or understandable. Makes sense, there's a big wind. So what word would be, we use to describe that message? Well, it was so distorted or difficult to understand. So, and so the word that works best here is garble. So that garbled is not coherent, and that means, again, there's a storm going on. And the other words do not work. Let's look at urgent and think, oh, well, it's an urgent situation. But the idea here is there's some quality about this message that makes it not understandable, and that word is garbled. It's urgent. It describes the context, but not the word that fits in the blank. In this sentence, we have a contrast between the bucolic backwaters, and bucolic means rural in a pleasant way. I think of nice red barns and contented cows grazing. What she does is to bring out the, a menace in this nice rural setting. And in her latest book, we want to go now to the blank and get that specific word. There's a surface of idyllic charm, that bucolic backwater. And what's happening is there's actually some menace, something negative underneath that charm. So a good word that works here is can mask, can hide also works nice, or disguise, something of that nature. Notice here the roiling underbelly. 
of intrigue, corruption, and murder speaks of the menace. And therefore, we can see how those parts play together. Again, the word we need, though, is here something like mask or hide. Now, subsume is kind of tempting because you see the underbelly, and I think, oh, under, subsume, sub means under. But subsume just means when one thing is placed underneath another thing. And that's obviously a pretty vague definition, but if I were to say, oh look, in the GRE we have geometry and it is subsumed under the general math section. That means it's placed under it or is a part of it. That doesn't really make sense here. What word does make sense though is belie, which is to falsely represent or disguise, to hide, to cover up as we have here, which is the answer. Counteract implies that something is being neutralized, as though the idyllic charm is stopping this underbelly of murder, etc., which of course it's not. And we know that because she actually brings out this palpable sense of menace, so it's still there. Preface reminds us of a book. Apparently this person's writing a book. But be careful. There is no contrast in time here, meaning that the idyllic charm came before and then suddenly there's this underbelly of corruption and murder. Complement means that two things actually add to each other. And I don't see that happening here because complement is a positive word. So for instance, if I have a little fedora, I don't know why I thought of a fedora, but a nice hat, and it really brings together my outfit, you would say it complements my dress shirt. I'm not sure last time I wore a fedora, but the point is it makes something better or improves upon it. We don't have that here. We have a context of nice on the surface, but underneath is the negative, and therefore B is the answer. This passage seems to turn on the word posturing. So we might think we need to understand how the author is using this word in context. Now I see a few clues that help out if I'm not familiar with posture as a verb, and these clues also help us fill in the blank. So first I see a contrast made between an outright snub and an implicit omission. And second, I have the word actually. So um, what the author is saying is that the literary in circles attitude may appear overtly to be a rejection. It's an outright snub, but in actuality or in reality, uh, the snub might be a tacit or covert or secret acknowledgement an implicit omission about uh, something. So with all our clues, what I've figured out is that the author is saying the in circle acts one way, but means something else. And that's what posturing means. Now, when it's used as a noun, it means a pose or stance. And hearing the word, you may be thinking about your own posture and sitting up a bit straighter in your chair. Now, when used as a verb, uh, to posture can literally mean to adopt a physical pose or stance, but we can also use it figuratively to mean assume a particular stance, but in this case, stance means attitude, and in particular, a pretended or fake attitude. So all of this tells us that when the end circle pretends to reject or hate the work, this fake attitude might tell us they actually feel the opposite. They may have a hidden positive attitude. So we can now eliminate all the negative options, irrelevancy, mediocrity, and rejection. The real attitude of the literary in circle is uh, not that this work doesn't matter, it's not irrelevant, um, that it is unexceptional, uh, that the work is mediocre, or that the work should be discarded, that uh, it should be rejected. All of these words um, would, would be consistent with an outright snub and not in contrast of this overt rejection. Now, as between our two positive options, merit and munificence, um, it's important uh, that you not confuse munificence with magnificence. Munificence means generosity or kindness, which would be an odd way to describe a literary work. So we're going to rule this one out. 
Now merit or value or quality is the best choice here. It's the correct choice. Although the in circle overtly treats the work with disdain, the fact that there's so much pretending or posturing might mean they are secretly acknowledging the work's value.